uh, how we're going to shape this industry, how we're going to be a part of it, how we're going to um, make it into what it's going to be, because that's sort of the exciting thing about this particular moment, is that as online video has continued to double and double and double, just as VidCon has continued to double and double and double, um, that th this feels like the moment where we're all going to sort of get together and decide not just what it's going to be like right now, but what it's going to be like for the next 10, 20 years. We get to define the culture of this thing, we get to define the industry of this thing, we get to define how we're going to connect to people, how we're going to work together, what kind of interactions we're going to have with each other, and that's why VidCon has been so important to me to provide that opportunity for us to do that together. So thank you all for coming out and doing that. The first, the first speaker we have today is one of the, I, I sort of started following his blog like six months back and realized that he's sort of one of the most uh, respected thinkers in entrepreneurialism, in venture funding stuff. Um, and he was an early investor in Maker Studios which uh, has continued to grow very quickly and, uh, and make a lot of impact in this space. So we're going to have uh, talk to us, Mark Suster. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to come talk about building an internet video company today. I will refer to it later as an MCN, but I kind of don't even know what the fuck an MCN is, so um, I thought at least on the opening slide I would call it internet video. And let's see if this actually works. It does. So this is me, uh, maybe a few years younger. I built two software companies. I sold my second one to Salesforce.com where I was a VP of products, so I'm a product guy at heart. Um, I helped run a venture capital fund based in Los Angeles called Upfront Ventures. It's a $200 million fund. We raise new funds every three years. We invest about 70% of it in Southern California, making us the largest venture capital investor in Southern California. We were the first investors in Maker Studios. Uh, Ezra, I saw out somewhere out in the crowd, uh, Ezra, uh, from full screen. We'll remember those days in the absolute shittiest offices you've ever seen. Uh, we invest along with uh, Graycroft. We're a lead investor in an internet video tools company called Epoxy TV, which I'll cover. And we're looking for more investments, so if you've got a good idea, make sure to approach me. My blog is both sides of the table. Uh, I think true to the fact that I focus a lot on video, I also produce a lot of video. Um, the slides I'll make available on SlideShare, but on YouTube, my show is called This Week in Venture Capital. And in the next 30 to 60 days, I'll be launching a new show, which I haven't talked about. Okay, so four topics I want to cover are the four topics I'm most often asked about. Number one, why the haters are wrong about YouTube. Number two, why YouTube is wrong about the haters. Number three, why video is the future of the entire internet. And number four, what's an MCN? There's that term, what's an MCN to do? So there's been a chorus of kind of YouTube haters. And it's, the, the meme is, can you really build a business on YouTube? Um, I just pulled two screen grabs. This is uh, Jason Kalkanis, who uh, runs a company called Inside.com and a conference called Launch. And he said, I'm not gonna work on YouTube's farm no more. And he created a YouTube Creators Bill of Rights. And he's one of the smartest thinkers in our industry, in the tech industry, and tech meets media industry. And a lot of what he said was right, and a lot of it, he missed the broader point. The core of the problem as I see it is the revenue share that YouTube takes, 45%. And that was the thrust of his argument, YouTube takes 45%. And every developer that I fund that works in the Apple ecosystem complains that Apple takes 30%, right? So you can imagine how people feel about YouTube. This is not the world's greatest clicker. Now, the problem gets worse for MCNs because there's this thing called talent. And I know at Maker Studios, we view ourselves as a talent first company. And is this kind of at odds the fact that YouTube is taking 45%, talent often takes 70%, in some cases higher. And when you think about it, 
MCNs start to look like ad network businesses. Ad network businesses are middlemen. Ad network businesses have large volume and low margin. Margin being profit. Uh, on average, MCNs make about 16.5% margin. That is not Microsoft or Google-like margin. And that is ad network margin. But the point that Calcanus missed, the point that every investor I've ever talked to about this industry has missed, is that the opportunity set is much larger. Number one, we have huge scale as an industry. And number two, we have opportunities to break out from the 16.5% margin business by producing content, not just aggregating it, by building direct customer relationships, by developing our owned and operated businesses, and by having business models that are not only ad-based. And again, I'll make these slides available because I'm gonna have to speed up a bit. When you think about YouTube, YouTube is not a business that you, you don't build your company as a YouTube company. YouTube is a video distributor. And at that, they're awesome. I've been calling YouTube the new Comcast. And people who make products have always clashed with distributors. It took me two minutes to find an example from just this week, Time Warner Cable and CBS. But this happens also in Walmart with people trying to sell products to them, McDonald's, anywhere where you have distributors of products. So I like to think of YouTube as the Walmart of video. And this is a theme I'd like to come back to. So imagine you don't sell content. Imagine you sell candy bars. My question for you, my question for the haters, are you gonna sell your candy balls, bars in Walmart? And that's your choice. You have significantly lower margin because 8% of every dollar spent in America, 8% of every consumer dollar spent in America is spent at Walmart. Imagine how much power they have. So you get lower margin and higher volume. Or, you can sell at a specialty shop nearby you. You can have really fat margins and really limited volumes. And in fact, if you look at Walmart itself, it has a million customers a week, $34 billion in monthly sales, almost a little bit over 4,000 locations. If it was ranked as a country, it would be the 19th largest country in the world. Pretty big. Bless it. Uh, YouTube, pretty powerful itself. A billion monthly uniques, a billion. That is 40% of the entire online population watches YouTube every single month. Six billion hours watched per month. And if you were to take every human on the planet, more than seven billion of us, divided by the videos watched per year, that's 150 videos per living human. And I'm guessing they're watching it a little bit less in Sub-Saharan Africa. They own 63% market share in units of videos consumed. Not in total viewing hours, but units. They are four times the largest, the second largest competitor in terms of uniques per month. This is Walmart-like domination. I'm gonna break this fucking thing. <laughs> I thought I'd give you an example from an MCN that I know very well, Maker Studios, have been involved with the company since just after its foundation. Thinking about scale, we sell almost all of our video through Walmart, through YouTube. We do four billion video views per month. Four billion. 260 million subscribers. 50% of those are international. Our majority of our audience, 80%, is youth-oriented, 18 to 34, the most coveted demo, 40% watching on mobile devices, and we've built an engineering team of 30 people, which by Google standards isn't large, but this is a major investment for Maker Studios in the technology and tools that we believe it takes to succeed in this industry. This is what happens when you sell on Walmart. You don't see this kind of scale. By the way, four billion is what Pinterest does per month. You know, one of the hottest technology companies out there does four billion impressions. That kind of puts us on par with them. 
So my suggestion to people is you sell at Walmart, you use it to build scale, you use it to build a brand, and then you do fulfillment at your local specialty shop or your own shop. You use it to have higher margin product at your own store. You have more product selection at your own store. Your most ardent and loyal fans go to your own store, and that's where you make much higher margin. But to not sell at Walmart is to not build that brand. And I think it's no different than, you know, with YouTube, do not confuse distribution with a business model. I think I'm gonna ask for five extra minutes on my presentation just for this clicker. So it's really just the top end of your funnel. That's how you should think about it from a business perspective. You have YouTube that has volume. You try to drive people to other places affiliates, other people who carry content, your owned and operated websites, if you can build and dis uh, deploy through mobile apps even better, if you can get registered, loyal, passionate customers you want to keep coming back even better. And the further down the funnel you get, the higher the ARPU, average revenue per user, the higher the margin, and of course less volume. And that's how it should be, and by the way, YouTube wants this. YouTube is not looking to have 100% um, on their network. So the name of the game to build a profitable MCN is margin expansion. You cannot be stuck in a 16.5% world. So there's only two ways to expand margin. One is on distribution. You will not drive 100% off YouTube and if you do you're limiting your opportunity. But if you had 20% through other people where your margins were better you could pick up let's say an additional 15%. If you could do 20% on your owned and operated website where you do have some cost because now you have marketing and technology costs, you will build a much higher margin business. We are a talent industry. <laughs> talent is what drives viewership. It's what drives audience. I'm not suggesting that you suddenly want no talent um, and don't want talent themselves to build authentic relationships with their audience, but you simply cannot build a talent only business. Just like with distribution, you need to think, how can I build formats that are talent independent or that have shared ownership with talent? Some formats that we actually own and can make higher margin on. And the game is, how do we make enough money for talent by having them be the top end of our funnel and yet still drive higher profit margins so we can run a profitable business? And ultimately, that's what we want, but that's what YouTube wants as well. They want us to have profitable businesses or there is no ecosystem. So if you're simply aggregating content, you're an ad network, or maybe we could think of ourselves as talent agencies, neither of which have particularly good margin. And yet, we believe you can build a sustainable MCN business on about 60% margins if you have the right mix of distribution, the right mix of content, and then on top of that, you have the opportunity to overlay transmedia opportunities to take it off of the internet and distribute it in other places. You have licensing opportunities, gaming opportunities, internationalization opportunities. And we only have to look at this media industry that's about an hour north of us here to see that the overwhelming majority of their profits have always come in the last, let's say, 15, 20 years from opportunities outside of the original running of their programs. So my view is haters are going to hate, the articles are going to continue. My recommendation to all of you is stay where your customers are, YouTube. Now, there is something that YouTube has missed. And I think YouTube doesn't understand the argument of the haters, or maybe even of the less haters. Their strategy seems to be to ignore the MCNs. Because let's be honest, we have no alternative. And, you know, you can become a bit tone deaf when you have that kind of market power. I think what they've really started to do is in the middle try to persuade us how much value they're providing us. And that's where the argumentation from YouTube's coming. So they can maintain their cut, no problem, because they have the market power to do so. I believe it's unwise. And I believe it's unwise for YouTube for reasons I'm going to point out. Starting with whack-a-mole. If you whack people enough, they will pop up other places. There is so much pressure in this industry to pop up in other places other than YouTube. If you want to build a business and you're on 16.5% margin, you have two choices, raise a shit ton of money 
or start selling stuff off YouTube. The whack-a-mole pressure will build. And I think YouTube, as I said, needs a profitable ecosystem, and that would be reason enough to think about it. When you think about YouTube, I think people don't appreciate enough the value they actually do provide. I have been a tireless advocate and promoter of YouTube as a platform and as a company as part of Google. When you think about it, the infrastructure alone that they provide, storage and hosting and something called CDN, which is a content distribution network, to make sure when someone logs in in Minneapolis or New York or Maine or San Diego, they're getting the same experience. And that comes from a CDN network. Ad sales, the fact that you can put stuff up there and magically somebody sends you money, it doesn't feel like they're providing a lot of value because it's not as much money as we want, but that's a huge investment. And then audience development, the fact that you can put stuff up there and people watch it is pretty valuable. And so when people talk about competition, they usually talk about what is Yahoo going to do? What is Microsoft going to do? What is Twitter or Facebook going to do? What is Netflix or Hulu or HBO? Even when I ask YouTube this question, who do you most fear? It's always one of these answers, always. And yet, I don't believe any of the true competitors are going to come from these guys. Eventually they will, but I don't think the biggest threat to YouTube is any of these guys. The biggest threat to YouTube is Amazon. Because Amazon is the true Walmart of online businesses. Think about the disaggregation of the YouTube stack. If you look at storage and hosting in CDN, the 85% or 80 plus percent market share leader in technically, forget books and music and videos and DVDs, they are crushing the entire IT industry in web hosting. And that's a large component of the value that YouTube provides and that YouTube is saying, you know, look at all this great stuff we give you. And Amazon views that as a loss leader. They don't mind taking 10 years of losses on that, uh, probably, which is why they're not profitable. And when you think about it, they don't have tools specifically for YouTube creators, but YouTube doesn't have the most sophisticated tools, if we're honest. Uh, but Amazon has a tremendous amount of ad, online ad sales. People just don't know it through things like IMDB, which they own. They can turn that on in a second. But most importantly, they could turn on audience development in a nanosecond if they chose to. And I've had this discussion all the way up one level below CEO. They get it. They just have other priorities right now. So Amazon exists on what's called disruptive technology, which is providing lower prices, lower margin, and capturing market share, driving competition out of the market. YouTube is acting like traditional media now, which is so ironic for Google. And they have the right to do so, and it's tremendously valuable to the ecosystem. I think it's short-sighted on YouTube's part. Because when you exist on these fat margins and other competition steps in, they can disrupt the entire industry. I would encourage my YouTube friends to go back and read Clayton Christian, Christensen Innovator's Dilemma. Do what Amazon's doing. You know, Amazon, with Amazon Web Services, every year, every company I invest in says, this year is the year I'm going to migrate from AWS to my own cloud hosting environment so that I can save money. And every year, Amazon cuts price two or three times without anyone asking. They just send you a letter and they say, by the way, we cut price again. Who does that? <laughs> they have cut prices since they launched AWS more than 35 times with absolutely no competition. That's the ruthless behavior of Amazon. So I would ask YouTube to think about that. How much power do they have? 219 million active uh, users of Amazon, active, every month. They have more than 30 million Kindle Fire users, have devices in their hands. They have more than $5 billion of monthly sales and a market cap of 140 billion. This is a company that really could gear up and compete and doesn't mind sustaining losses. So YouTube can certainly ignore the MCNs which they've been doing a great job of. But the competition will not. The competition will not. 
So why is video the future of the internet and why don't most investors understand this? On the left hand side you have production. On the right hand side you have distribution. This is the world that we've existed in for 50 years. On the right hand side, if you think about it, there are time slots. There used to be three of them when I was a kid, then there was four of them, then you have cable and satellite. But you still have limited time slots. In a world of limited time slots, you need to fill those slots with the most expensive stuff you can to get the largest audience that you can, and you are bound geographically by the people who are watching you. That produces content that is very high budget, requires huge marketing expense, has no customer relationship because the minute I put out Tosh.0, I have no idea who's watching it at all. I have psychographic and demographic and whatever, but I don't know who's watching it. And that is what's produced hits-driven businesses. And the world has changed under our feet and people don't seem to understand it. Distribution costs have gone down by more than 99%. How many industries does that happen in? Traditional TV is about $100,000 per minute, and there's many shows that are more expensive than that. YouTube video is about $1,000 a minute. Distribution is unlimited. There's no slots. You put it up there, it's evergreen. You put it up there and people in China watch it, people in Nairobi watch it, people in Tokyo watch it. You don't have a choice, they just watch it. We have global audiences, and I think Gangnam Style really proved that. So for the first time in history, people who produce content can have a direct relationship with the people who watch the content. And that is what's gonna change our industry. Because you have the ability to have subscribers. Now subscribers live in an ecosystem called YouTube. But you have the ability to get email addresses, you have the ability to get mobile phone numbers, you have the ability to drop cookies on people's computers, you have the ability to ask people to opt in. And as people opt into your business and as you send them YouTube messages, Twitter messages, send them emails, content starts to look more like Guilt Group, which is sending you your daily blast of handbags and dresses and other things you don't need with incredibly high open rates because people have said, I want to receive this. And there is no middleman in email. So ironically, at a time where VCs up north are criticizing the content-driven business, the consumer app mobile industry has become the biggest hits industry business there is. If you're not a star in Silicon Valley, you don't get your $20 million. You don't get to create a company called Milk that nobody uses. <laughs> and then Google buys. <laughs> they have their own set of stars. And just before you think I'm a hater, I grew up in NorCal. I grew up a tech geek. Uh, I've lived in uh, SoCal for half my life, but uh, I'm not a hater. Uh, I just think people don't understand it. Why is internet the future of, why is video the future of the internet? People watch six hours of video a day. Six hours. Five of that, more than five of that in traditional TV. You are not gonna change media consumption patterns. They are pretty well established and pretty well set. People read apparently 48 minutes a day. We're not gonna suddenly flip those and read six hours a day and share video 48 minutes a day. And if you accept that, then you accept that the future of the internet is video. And the video paradigm is changing. It's becoming two-way. We know about YouTube. Of course, increasingly, we know about Vine and Glide and FaceTime and all of these other platforms for producing and distributing video. And that, I believe, will change the entire structure of the internet, which is why we're making so many investments in the video space. So what's an MCM to do? These are my last slides. Number one, tech is critical. And this town doesn't understand this enough. You either, as a business, not as an individual creator, as a business, you must invest millions and millions of dollars in technology as a differentiator, as Maker does, as Fullscreen does, as Tastemade does. Or, if that's not your game, your game is content or talent or some other differentiator, or you want to be individual talent or aggregated talent, there are tool businesses that are emerging. We all probably know Zephyr. Uh, we are an investor in a company called Epoxy. We're also an investor in a company called Awesome. There are components of this business that you can use 
and use the technology tools and a lot of these tool providers are not trying to compete with you and also become video businesses. <coughs> so important examples of tech components that you need to understand and I'm not going to go through each one in detail but I will provide the slides. Analytics and conversion tracking and A-B testing. You know, in a world in which you put it on broadcast and you look at what Nielsen says, fine, you get the data from Nielsen. In a world where I put some stuff on Twitter and some on Facebook and some on YouTube and some in iTunes and some now through Hulu and through Netflix, the link text you use can determine whether you get 25% more views. The time of day that you post things can do it. The fact that somebody else promotes your video can drive it. The fact that you choose a thumbnail with cleavage in it, trust me, drives at least three times more consumption. <coughs> And I'm not joking, by the way, I have all the data. Simply A-B testing, what you put out in thumbnail, what you put out in link tests will have a considerable impact on your business. Audience development tools, how do you build fans and likes and followers and people who feel compelled to share? What if someone in your network who shares things could drive consumption of your uh, content by 20%? Wouldn't you like to know who that person was? so that you could maybe reward them. Asset management, tagging your stuff so that you can distribute it in other formats. Content management systems so you can distribute via mobile. Um, this company I mentioned we invested in Epoxy and, and the founding team is here, have built tools to take stuff from YouTube and programmatically put it in your Facebook feed, in the open graph on Facebook, through Twitter, they're building Pinterest. So you can either build the tools or borrow the tools, but you cannot exist without the tools. So this world in which we have businesses on 10 to 30% mar uh, margin cannot be long-term sustainable as a large business. You must do some level of production, packaging, and programming in order to expand margin. Uh, in terms of the third point, and there's only five, is building direct customer relationships. How do you do that? The currency, the asset, of power, the asset of power on the internet is customer information. If you have no customer information and Google changes the search algorithm, you're forked. If you have loyal audience that tunes into you that you have the ability to push stuff to them and they actually want to receive it from you, you have real value, you have real power, you have the power to move audiences, you have the power to move audiences, which is what makes distribution less onerous to you as a company when Walmart can't suddenly, or let's say Costco, can't suddenly swap your candy bars out and put Kirkland candy bars on its shelf because customers will revolt and go down the street and buy it somewhere else, that's when Costco doesn't fuck with you. And you need to globalize. Unlimited distribution. This chart shows how much of YouTube is consumed international versus US. I know you get low margin internationally right now on ad sales, but it's not simply I produce it and whoever watches it watches it and whatever revenue you send me, you send me. You need to globalize your businesses. You need offices in China, in Japan, Malaysia, the UK, Germany, France, it's a big world out there. We are a small part of that world. Finally, you need to create non-ad revenue streams. On the left-hand side is an example of Star Wars revenue. The hmm. Star Wars franchise has produced 70% of its profits and revenue from outside of the movie sales itself, 70%. What are you doing to think about how you're expanding your margin and your relationship, and again back to relationship, the way you do this is by having people who are passionate about your products. That they want to get stuff like these little tchotchkes on the right hand side that my kids seem to love. Not the knives, the... Uh, <laughs> they may like knives, I don't know. Um, but think about how big a business Angry Birds has built outside of that app ecosystem, and that also reinforces your brand. The more people have your merch, the more they're interested in your brand and the content that you produce. So that's all I got. Thank you very much.